All right, please allow me to introduce Dr. Bill Philpott. Dr. Philpott is a professor at the, in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Cornell University. While his field is remote sensing, his perspective is in changing and understanding the interaction of light with the Earth's surface, such as water, vegetation, and soil. He began as a graduate student in marine studies at the University of Delaware studying coastal oceanography, but has come to consider other water and land applications including agriculture, forestry, geology, and others. Bill's current interest is in characterizing wet soils. Bill will be presenting on spectral reflectance of wet soils, implications for modeling. Thank you. And uh, can, oh wow, that's great. Uh, can you all hear me? Or should I wear a, a microphone? Okay. You're good. You're good. Good. Okay. Um, hey, well, something that occurred to me is when I was a graduate student in oceanography, I wanted to do field spectroscopy and called around to companies, and this is in the 70s, to see if I could find one. And it was met generally with about five seconds of absolute silence <laughs> because they did not exist. I really do appreciate this, these instruments. As a note. Okay, yeah, I'm interested in how wet soils affect spectral reflectance. And I've been using this slide for a long time. It's, it's the best one I've found, and it's right north of Cornell. It's in Ithaca. But you can see the drainage patterns in the, in the soil. Because I've been saying because they're wet. And oh, I also need to introduce Cha Tian, uh, who is sitting back there, most, all of the data that I'm going to show are data that she has collected and we're used for her thesis, and she's continuing on, so I'm usurping much of her work. But uh, at her thesis defense, uh, one of the faculty members said, well, you know, that isn't necessarily wet, because water brings different materials as it drains, and it deposits them along the way, so that could be dry soil with different material. I say it's wet. <laughs> okay. And spectrally, if I could look at that spectrally, I could prove that, but I, I have to make that point now. Okay, but wet soil darkens, water darkens the soil. So what I'm interested in is what, what are those spectral changes and how does that tell you more about the soil? Not just can you pull out the wetness, but can you tell something about the, the soil itself? And just want to understand what's going on there. Okay, I'm, whoa. All right. <laughs> this is, I'm gonna repeat some slides that I showed at an ASD sem uh, symposium uh, six years ago. <laughs> is it me? Receive the connector. This could be an exciting presentation, I guess, in the ways I don't intend. If I don't touch it, will <laughs> oh, The spectra that you're flickering, is flickering at you is uh, data from Lobel and Asner of 2002. And they collected periodically, uh, as soil dried, they picked, collected spectra just to come up with a model and some description about what was going on. And um, maybe there's another connector here that would work. Is this?
Why do you do that? Okay. Sorry about that. Stable. Okay. Oh, it, some things to point out. Uh, this is the black line is the saturated soil. So it's the blue line up here is air dry. Uh, air dry. I'm sorry. The gray line is air dry. The blue line is oven dried soil. Okay. So first of all, soil gets darker as you get it wet. Now, this is the visible, this grayed out area is the visible. So this is what we're seeing. And yeah, it gets darker. Eventually, uh, before it gets too wet, it just gets uh, uh, stabilizes in color. That changes, you get much more range when you get out to the infrared, and a tremendous range when you get to the shortwave infrared and the change in color. Uh, now, I was coming at this uh, from an understanding of water, and when I looked at that, I thought, that's just the water absorption spectrum. That's all we're seeing. I can model this very easily. No sweat. Easy. And I did. And what I got uh, was a set of models. These are the four data sets that uh, uh, Lovell and Asner collected. And my model is the dotted lines that overlay that. Okay, not bad. But it was a, honestly, it was a terrible model. It's not, not, good physical ideas it was just throwing something together saying I can I can match those curves and I'll point out where I can't in here in particular I could not match that consistently in this particular case it could here not so much here it's particularly bad and it missed in, I was missing some very important physical properties of the soil so that, that model was crude, it got my interest, and I finally found out how complicated soils were and moved on to looking at this. Okay, so this is my favorite slide. Just because it fits doesn't mean you can believe it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, these are the three soils that Chad uh, measured. Uh, it chose those because they are so different. We have the quartz sand, which is very large, uh, coarse sand, the masonry sand, which is relatively fine sand and darker, multiple materials, and then Ithaca soil, which is sort of typical soil of this region, uh, uh, a um, very, uh, uh, what's it, a clay loam, silty loam soil. It's so very small particles, very different colors. So we've got, a, we've got a range of things going on with this. Uh, this is our setup, this is our goniometer. This uh, device here, homemade, uh, very much like, well, homemade, it's like chips in that it's homemade, it's not like chips in that it's much simpler. It's just a one dimensional piece. But our, the thing is we were using an eight degree field of view, uh, looking at the soil, the soil sitting on a scale, we measure the amount of water that's remaining in the sample by just by weight. So it's filled, it's saturated, and we watch the soil dry. So that's what we do. We watch soil dry. Uh, the <laughs> basic idea is the, the is fairly large sample holder, uh, field of view of the eight centimeter, eight, uh, I'm sorry, the two, eight, to eight degree field of view detector. We're now using a three degree field of, three degree field of view detector get in there. Also wanted to have a microscope to watch the thing as it's drying. This is kind of fun. 
a movie of soil drying, right? That would be my <laughs> next YouTube video. Uh, in order to put the water in and not disturb the surface, you have a, a little port on the side that inserts the water at the base so the water can infiltrate up. This minimize, the idea is to minimize the amount of uh, air space that holds out in the pores. If you pour in the top, you could get potentially some uh, remaining air spaces in the pores. Hopefully, if you put it in at the bottom, it's absorbed up, it it's, uh, percolates up, and fills all the spaces and becomes as saturated as possible. Um, the, the Back to the water absorption spectra, it's showing this in a little bit different form. The, I wanted to point out that there is a six order of magnitude difference in the range of the absorption coefficient from the visible, from the blue range, up to the shortwave infrared. That's a huge range. Things are going to be looking very different depending on when you're looking, which range you're looking at and what characteristics you're, you're checking. So, and I want to point that out and sort of draw some implications from that. Okay. These are the spectra, uh, or selected spectra, that Cha made. And this is the port sand up, the, uh, up here, the masonry sand here, and the Ithaca soil here. Uh, wet to dry. Notice that the quartz sand starts off slowly, doesn't change much for a while. And this is a constant, let me describe something here. The evaporation rate is constant. All the loss, all the water loss is through evaporation. We have a sealed sample holder. All the water loss is from evaporation. It's drawing up the water from the volume, keeping a fairly uniform water surface, and constant, um, constant evaporation rate up to this point. Constant evaporation here, up to that point. Constant evaporation here, up to this point. All of this change, is, it's not a uniform change with the, with the rate of loss of water, which is, was interesting right away. Um, but look at the differences between the soils. This goes up, stops basically, looks the same for a while, and then slowly increases in a huge jump in a very short period of time. These are one hour intervals. With the masonry sand, it basically does not change initially, gradually changes and then huge leap. With the Ithaca soil, the very small particles, first of all, it's saturated and doesn't change. It just hangs out. Then the water content begins to change. It changes almost steadily until here and then a leap. Okay, so the, something's very different. Primarily, it's the particle size distribution, it's the pore spacing that's different, it's changing the way the water is, is held in the soil, and that's changing the reflectance properties. Okay. And, uh, Cha, uh, let me go back. Okay. It won't go back, so. <laughs> well, it will go back slowly. <laughs> Chow looked at this and thought, you know, what's the most sensitive? Right here, here, at the water absorption bands. That should be the most sensitive to the water content. Why don't we look at that? And the idea would be, was that, well, the more water there is, the deeper this depth of this feature should be. So as the water content increases, that should increase. That the, the height should increase. And this is sort of the model that we were thinking of. This is at the 970 and 1160 nanometer water absorption bands, and yeah, that's, that's what you're getting. We only saw this, though, with the quartz sand. So this nice linear change, or nearly linear change, with uh, reflectance to water content was there. What we saw with the others, at the, in, first of all, in the other sands, in the other soils, we didn't even see the water absorption band at uh, 970 and 1160. It wasn't there. I'll explain that in a minute. We did see it at, <coughs> at 1440 and 1930, but it was not a nice, simple relationship with the water content. 
and this was problematic, particularly here, where instead of the water, the depth of the water absorption band increasing as the water content increased, it decreased. This is not good. This was not our idea. So the next piece was to model this, try to see if we could describe what was going on with this very uh, little, if the other order, if the first model was a zeroth order, this is a maybe a half order model. It's, it's just a little bit better. But the idea was at radiance coming in, a little bit reflected off the surface, water, air water surface, some absorption through the water reflected off the soil water interface, back up through the water, some reflect through some loss right here at the water air interface and measure that. That means that we get the reflectance, it's just the downwelling irradiance and the up, uh, upwelling irradiance over the downwelling irradiance and we get then one reflection from the water soil interface, two reflections from the water air interface and the attenuation through the water. That's it, very simple. Just a layer of water over a uniform soil surface. And what we got was the curves down here. And to my surprise, they look an awful lot like the curves that we got for the, uh, for the soil. We have this uh, nearly linear uh, transformation for the um, 970 and 1160 bands. This slow curve for the 1440 band and the peak and quick drop off for the 1930 band. So it could explain a little bit of what's going on. And let's see, that's the quartz sand. Okay, it's not a great model. I'm not suggesting that you use this uh, really absolutely apply it, but it gives us the right shapes. It gives us the right idea. Oh, and then if we take the derivative of this difference uh, with respect to the, the thickness of the water layer, you can solve for the thickness of the water layer at that point. And that tells me that roughly it's gonna be at about 100 microns. When you get a water layer that thickness to 100 microns, then that's gonna be a peak. Well, probably what's happening is that the bulk of the water has, uh, Oh, sorry, I'm learning this. The bulk of the water has gone right in here. The it's the water is absorbed onto the particle surfaces. It's not in the pores anymore, and it's uh, that's that's what we're seeing, and that's where we're getting this very thin layer of uh, water. One other piece on this is that the, uh, this is the, uh, the evaporation rate. So the, uh, computing the evaporation rate and just monitoring it over, over time is virtually constant for all three soils for most of the drying period. At the end of the drying period, it takes a dive. Here, there is poor water and it's feeding let me describe what's probably going on. It's saturated to begin with. The soil is absolutely saturated at the beginning. Only losses from evaporation. If some water evaporates, it draws water up. The capillary forces are greater than the gravitational forces in the water and the soil surface. So it just pulls water up. Eventually, some air pockets form in the soil. And it's not in uniform. It, an air pocket will uh, appear in one spot, an air pocket will appear in another spot, usually in the larger pore spaces. So they'll, they'll show up there first. Eventually all the pore water, the available pore water will be gone. They'll just be meniscus uh, in between the soils and water absorbed onto the soils. At the end, that, that water eventually comes out and all that's left is the absorbed water and then that goes. What we're seeing here right here is we've gotten to the point where there's only absorbed water and that's dropping off. So we're getting uh, a change in the, absor in the evaporation rate. It's decreasing at that point. Up until that point, there's always some liquid water to draw from and then you lose it. 
Well, entirely fortuitously, this drop-off occurs at the same time as that. We're looking at different things. <laughs> we're looking at reflectance and we're looking at evaporation rate, and they happen to coincide when the water adsorbed to the particles is disappearing and you're starting to see some particle left over. It happens with all of the soils, no matter what, even though the timing is very different uh, with the volume water content or with the actual time, we're seeing the same sort of thing going on. And it's here is where it happens, here is where it happens, and in here. Uh, between the brown and the, it's it's a slower it's a slower change here, but it's the same thing going on. Okay, so we've got some physical relationship between the change in reflectance and what's going on with the water in the in the soils. Uh, let's see, I think that's okay. So I had a few implications. First, water absorption can ch in the in the short wave infrared. Water absorption controls the change in reflectance. Let me go back one slide and point out something. I, can, I can't see it well here. See this feature? That's a soil absorption feature. That appears when the soil is dry. Notice that it disappears as we go down, and it doesn't take much water to wipe that out. The water absorption is wiping out the soil characteristic features. It, they're gone. That's, uh, that even happens here. Um, let's see. Yeah, here. You can see it better in the masonry sand. That's the soil absorption feature. It's gone. Uh, all of the, so water is controlling the color change in the, uh, even on both the magnitude and in the subtleties. It's controlling the uh, reflectance characteristics. Soil, spec soil spectral features are masked by the water absorption. And water mass the soil, the water absorption, the water optical path is a useful metric. So how, and that's going to be a spectrally changing thing. How far is the, is the light getting through the water before it's pretty much gone? Uh, I could go into that more if anybody's interested later. But, oh, okay. Water absorbs in a strongly wavelength dependent, so we're going to have different types of effects in different ranges. Notice we really couldn't see the, the swear one absorption bands, if you will, the shorter wavelength absorption bands in anything but the quartz sand because the water optical path was uh, only long enough in the quartz sand in order to, to be able to see those absorption features. In the far longer wavelengths, uh, we could see the same, we could see the absorption bands in all of the, um, all of the soils. Um, then one optical path is going to be related, it's going to be related to the size and distribution of the particles and the size and distribution of the pore spaces, the rate of change, the characteristic uh, bands that are available and the way they change are going to be related to the uh, pore spaces and the particle sizes. The disposition of the water, where is it? Is it liquid water in the pores? Is it absorbed on the surfaces? Is it in menisci in between the, the particles? Um, so that those are going to be controlling that, which also suggests that this should change with angle. We have a goniometer. We haven't used it as a, we haven't made all the measurements at angles yet, but we expect significant changes in the uh, spectral reflectance as we change the viewing angle. Uh, and as the water content changes. Okay, I've got to move a little more quickly here. Go back to this, the water absorption. Okay, here, the water optical, the attenuation, they've got an absorption of 0.1 per centimeter. So an attenuation length over uh, a million, uh, millimeter or so. In here, there's virtually no attenuation by water over these lengths. We've got millimeters at most of water. It's, it's not going to be absorbing. It's not going to be scattering. It's got to affect the reflection in some other way. And just to prove it, in the visible, even in the red, I mean, this is about a foot deep tank. And we can see every possible color within our visual range, from blue to red. Water's not 
terribly removing much of the light. At 10 meters, if you're a diver and you go 10 meters, yeah, red's gone. But at a few millimeters, no, it's there. So is the short wave. So is the very near infrared. It's there. Water's not absorbing. It's not, not long enough path length to scatter much. It can only change the color of the water by changing the relative index of refraction. So the light comes in, it's more likely to be scattered forward. It's more likely going to change the interaction there. What's happening is that the, it's enhancing the absorption by the soil. Or that's my hypothesis at least. So my hypothesis here, absorption and scattering by water, pure water, is negligible at these distances. The darkening results from soil absorption and improved soil absorption because there's more multiple scattering, light's getting deeper into the soil, more opportunity for absorption, more light's absorbed. But it's absorbed by the soil. Um, and then, since the particle diameter is much less than, uh, much less than the wavelength, and the wavelength is, uh, I'm sorry, much less than one micron, and the wavelength much greater than one micron, particle <coughs> sizes are much greater than micron, the wavelength is much less than the micron, I'm going to assume that the scattering phase function is constant over this range, over this wave, per wavelength, wavelength independent. I don't know what it is, but I assume it's constant. So the linear color of the soil will not change as the reflectance decreases. Okay, so no color change, just amplitude change. And now, you, you know the, Probably everybody here knows the vegetation index, the normalized difference vegetation index. But this is two, this, is, this is in Maryland. This is uh, Delmarva Peninsula. This is the this uh, high, this is hyperspectral imagery. But this is just 675, the red versus the infrared band at 877. Scatter plot can been converted to reflectance, so the NDVI should work. Along the diagonal would be an NDVI of zero, any an NDVI up to one up here, and here's a soil line. Uh, in the and if I block that out, oh I got this. Okay, I've got two different types of soil. I've got outlined in green here and outlined in blue there. I've got the bright soil and the darker soil. Let me go back so you can see. Dark, I have two types of soil basically outlined in the scatter plot and I can outline them there very neatly by just my hypothesis then is that the main difference here is from dry to wet from dry to wet and that that will obtain in every spectral band through the visible through the near infrared up to about 900 nanometers as soon as and as long as the water absorption is low enough so that line, nah, it doesn't, maybe it's not just dry to wet, maybe it's a little different material in there, but that's, that's the idea. Okay, if that hypothesis is true, then if I took the principal component, principal components analysis of those spectra of the soils from wet to dry, the first principal component should have 99% of the variance. And most of the variance that's left over, explained by the remaining principal components, should be pretty much random. Okay. Well, this is using the using Chow's data for the quartz sand. It's pretty linear, as as predicted. It falls along the line, the di the radial line to the zero zero point. So there's no color change, at least in these two bands. So so far so good. Go to the, um, the the masonry sand. It's not bad, but there's point out that there's a little bit of a, a curve here. It gets a little brighter in the infrared, a little dark, and then darkens lit down here. It's also a peculiar increase. It gets darker, 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 and then brightens. Anybody have any ideas what that is? I'll, I'll show you in a minute. And then the the, uh, the Ithaca soil is more shifted. It's more infrared than red than the other. So the color, the the basic color is a little bit different, but it follows this. There, 
follows that basic line, also has a return. You can see it strongly there. This is super saturated soil. It's not only is the water in the pore spaces, it's actually on the surface, making a continuous water surface. You're seeing specular reflection from the surface. Um, here. So you can see, dry, drying, wet, and saturated. This saturated is actually brighter than that, just because of the specular reflection. So I'm, I surely shouldn't, this is oversaturated, a little bit too much water. It's almost a continuous water surface. And the, the orientation of the surface is directing water into the detector. That's why you get that last little bit of increase. Okay. But basically the color has not changed. It's brighter to darker, but the color has not changed. If I look at the principal components, of the spectra, this is the first principal component versus the second principal component, but no scaling. This is scaled to stretch the second principal component. This is virtually linear. So, so there's no appreciable change in color as you're adding the water. These, by the way, are the eigenvectors. So this shape, the blue, is the first principal component, the first eigenvector. It's basically the color spectrum of the soil in this, in this range. The second eigenvector, the red, is a contrast between the, uh, the infrared, which is positive numbers, and the red and the visible, which are negative numbers. Third principal component kind of kind of contrasts the in middle range to the end ranges, but it's noisy and the 99.7% oh, of the variance from the first eigenvector, the first principal component, less than 3% of the variance in the second principal component, and a marginal amount in the third principal component. We've got 500 other principal components with less. <laughs> um, okay. This, by the way, is the dry to wet Okay, there is, this is not noise. There's something organized going on there. I don't know what that is, and if anybody has any thoughts, please let me know. This is, I don't understand why that's not just random noise. Um, the next, I go to the masonry sand. Again, I have 99.8% of the variance explained by the first principal component, less than 2% two-tenths of a percent explained by the second principal component and some really trivial amount in the third principal component. Again, the blue line is the first eigenvector and that's essentially the spectrum, the reflectance spectrum of the material. Again, there's a contrast between the visible and the infrared. Uh, the, the sign has changed negative to positive, but it's basically just a contrast. And the third principal component, I'm going to pretend is not there because it explains so little data. But this, now, <coughs> the second principal component, there's structure there. Something's going on. Something's changed right there. I don't know what that is. It's, um, so that's, that's, but there's something happening with that, the, the structure of the soil that's different. This is almost two linear lengths. lengths. This one's a continuous curve. I have no idea what that difference is, what could cause it. Um, last one, the, the Ithaca soil. Uh, again, 99.9% .9 of the variance by the first principal component, less than 2% for the second and something, again, very trivial for the third. And the second principal component, there's, it's very small variance, but something's going on. Okay, my conclusions. Um, I think my hypotheses were basically right. Absorption and scattering of pure water is negligible. It's really not affecting it spect uh, affecting the spectra spectrally directly. It darkens the soil darkening as a result of soil absorption, and that's uh, explained by the first principle component being 99.9 percent .9 of the variance. And the veneer color does not change as the reflectance decreases. 
doesn't really change subtly. There is coherent color information though in the second PC, so there is some color change. Uh, represents a contrast between the near infrared and the visible. So it's got to be either subtle water absorption effects or some wavelength dependent of the scattering phase function. Or maybe somebody else has another suggestion. No hands going well, on. Yeah. You done? Oh, I'll wait till the end. If you want. Okay. It's just that, that I'm, I'm basically there. This is this is my this is my last slide. Oh, and yeah, that's the last slide I intended to show. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, then I will take. I'll be happy to take questions. Yes. Oh, oh no, go ahead. You're fine. Oh, well, I, you know, one of the, I mean, the amount of scattering you get at each, I mean, you get scattered any time there's an immature fraction yeah. change. And when you put water in there, you replace the air with water. Right. And uh, the, the water doesn't have a constant index or a fraction across the, wavelength range, but if you look at the wavelength dependence of, of index or fraction of water, it actually has the same a shape very similar to your second PC. So I'm wondering if that is a that you might you might have something there. Right. That would be interesting. Wow. So okay. Because um, um. so the amount of scattering you get off those grain water boundaries is going to have wavelength dependence because the index or a fraction of water because the index changes. You know, from you're, you're, to you're absolutely right. I've been thinking of the index of refraction of water being virtually constant. No. But neither no. that or the soil is constant. Right. So well, then every mineral grain is going to have its own little yeah. index or refraction function. And so it's the bigger the contrast, the more scattering you get. So the interaction of the, I love of the index I or refraction function of the water and the grains themselves will. Nice. Thank you. Okay. Take can, do I have time for one more? Yeah. Just. Um, yeah, actually, two, two points. Some of these subtle water absorption effects that you were hitting on across all the, the different materials or all the different samples that you had could be explained by the clay content or the fine content. Did you look at that? For the for the Ithaca soil, that's true. For yeah. the uh, for the others, there was for the quartz and for the masonry sand, there was very little. Um, Okay. With very little organic material. Yeah, and then the other thing, it's um, my background is more from the soil mechanics side of things. So seeing sort of the, the the measurements that you took over time, I think it would be very interesting to look at from um, a, uh, a water content or percent saturation yep. point of view, as opposed to because you're drawing in a heterogeneous manner. You saw on the surface that one area was dry and one was not, and you're sampling yep. that. But I think it'd be very interesting to actually create more of a homogenous sample out of for each one, and, and actually just have one value of the the water content in each in each sample. I, I may need to talk to you a little bit more about that. Okay. All right. Thank you.